Now, this has been a long time coming. We have so wanted to get to this, and we are now here. Did the ancients sail around Africa to get from the Mediterranean Sea to the Atlantic Ocean into the Indian Ocean? Did they circumnavigate the continent of Africa? And also in the other direction, doesn't matter in either direction, whichever, right? Was that even possible? Hmm. Now, did the Phoenicians and Greeks, well, they say so, they do, and academia says, well, nah, uh well, because they don't believe the history as it's written. Hmm. Well, it's okay to question, no problem, but when you do so just because something doesn't fit your paradigm, so rather than adjusting your paradigm to fit the facts, you make the facts fit your paradigm. That's called backwards reasoning, and not a single one of them will after these videos, if ever they actually watch them. But those who will, will know this for certain. Oh, they won't, of course. Uh, they'll still try to answer, and some will even try to challenge, uh, which is why we don't allow such unless one watches. No debate in ignorance here. Our channel, our rules. That's right. I said it again, and I'm going to keep saying it. Now, this will be a three to four part mini series. Haven't quite decided yet, but uh, we'll get through all of this over the next couple of weeks. We're going to release these just one after the other uh, within Solomon's Gold series. Yes, we're back to that same topic for good reason because this is where it belongs. This first video will set foundations specifically regarding biblical accounts where the Bible says ancients circumnavigated, they sailed around Africa as fact. The Bible is fact, you know. If you don't believe that, well, don't call yourself a Bible scholar, <laughs> uh, you know, or a believer of the Bible. And yes, it most definitely does, no doubt, say that. Uh, that will be our foundation. I know, how dare we set our foundation on the Bible. Yeah, we get that. But we always will here. So, I mean, that's far more academic than most so-called academics, uh, for that matter. So let's establish this. Then we'll show you credible, affirmed, written history that the Phoenicians, Greeks, most certainly did circumnavigate Africa in ancient times. Boom. So, did the Persians, uh, it appears, there's a bit more uh, hazy as far as pinning down the details, uh, but the Greeks are not. Uh, then we'll cover the first century mapping mindset in the following video after that, where we will explain how to read the maps of that era. Uh, and this is groundbreaking, really. I, I'm, it's... Uh, in some ways, it's hard to believe that we would have to teach this because academics should have done this a long time ago. But we have never seen anybody really explain this and set it up so people can understand. Uh, what was missing from these maps and why? And what wasn't missing and why? Why were these things there? Such as these two islands southeast of China, which are always placed southeast of China. Hmm. What could they be? And why are they always there? And how did they even know about them? Hmm, interesting indeed. This will clear up much for many. Anyone can go grab a map here or there, but we need to understand how to read it. Yeah, I know one of our critics can't even read a map. I mean, you should read his blog. Actually, don't bother. It is a waste of time. Then finally, and it will probably be a fourth video, I'm guessing, but not sure. Uh, we're going to break out the big guns and take you all the way back to 800 BC. And before that, we will locate the infamous Oceanus River, a worldwide river system hmm, which fits the rivers from Eden. Oh, what? What is this? You mean the Greeks affirm the Bible? Ooh, we'll see. Now, we've covered 
exactly from a different perspective, of course. Uh, so, But we've covered the Rivers from Eden in massive detail, and if you haven't watched that series, River from Eden series, then you're missing tons, and what a revelation that is. This will demonstrate the Greeks affirm, though, that they circumnavigated Africa in that period. That's 800 BC. You'll see for yourself. And even long before, and these are hugely significant accounts, academia loves but does not know how to read in the proper paradigm. Uh, because, again, they ignore the Bible, so they don't understand what the Greeks are even talking about. And you see, we will. You will. Now, we'll fix this, and you will understand uh, by the end of these uh, three or four videos. Uh, by the time we're done, boom. There it is, proven. See for yourself, watch, test, and learn. Let's begin with the famous ships of Tarshish from the Bible, but also other historic narratives, by the way, mention these ships. Uh, we're not going to go into all of that, but we're going to open with this just to remind everybody who this Tarshish was, because he was, well, Greek. Duh. I know, many so-called academics will tell us the Bible is not a history textbook like a broken record. Uh, they can't even think through the statement. <laughs> because what a stupid paradigm when they repeat such a robotic mantra without even thinking about what they are saying. They just told us that the most well-documented text of all time, whether one believes the theology or not, which is impertinent, which prove, provides details of historic figures and places, well, is not actually history. That's stupid. That's not academic. Anyone covering ancient history, which, let's be clear, many of them don't, and they dismiss most of ancient history in a false paradigm. They just don't want to know it. So they basically admit they know nothing and don't want us to know anything either. Peter called that willing ignorance in 2 Peter 3, and that is exactly why the creation and flood narratives would be under attack, and they are in our age right now. And in fact, most Bible scholars don't even believe those accounts. They don't believe the Bible and the creation and the flood. That's pathetic. They are Bible scoffers, not Bible scholars. Let's be clear. And that alone is a great litmus test to decide. You want to know their doctrines? Whoa, stop right there. Do they believe creation and the flood as it's written in the Bible? If they don't, they're scoffers. They're not scholars. The Bible tells us this dude, Tarshish, who became famous for his ships. How? Hmm, let's talk about it. Was a son of Javan or Iwan. Basically, uh, Ion, Ion, uh, Javan founded Greece. See, there's no J, no V in ancient Hebrew. I mean, it's just not there. Um, no, not China communist agitators who can't read. China was never Greece, duh. I can't believe that there's a channel that actually made a video trying to claim that. Yes, they tried. Uh, the thing is, and this is so obvious to anyone who can read. Tarshish and his brothers received an inheritance from their father. The Greek Isles, that's what Genesis 10 says. Were they incredible swimmers? I mean, Olympic, well, no, they'd have to be better than that, actually. <laughs> uh, duh, not that good. Just doesn't work. This means they needed to find a way to float on water to get to their inheritance, the Greek Isles. Now, I know the concept is so foreign to the ancestors, not that far removed from Noah, you know, and his three sons who built a super tanker, which specs mankind had not replicated until the past century or so, in steel even, not wood. But we are supposed to believe that Noah and his sons never shared this knowledge with their grandchildren, yet there was now a new world ocean to cross, Nonsense. And the Bible says so. Now, Tarshish is from the family Japheth, 
not Shem. Let's be clear. He's not. But the ships of Tarshish are invoked as early as 2200 BC. Tarshish is in this narrative somehow. Why? He's transporting Ophir and his brothers who didn't have ships because they lived in the middle of Iran, in the eastern side, where there was nothing to float on but a, a small river. Uh, so basically, Ophir and his brothers return to ancient Havila, the land of Noah, the land of Eve, the land of Adam's righteous generations from Adam and Eve's exile from the garden all the way up until the flood. That's what the book of Enoch says, and it's really what the Bible says. Even its name, Havila, is very clear. That's Hava, Eve. Uh, that's her name. I don't. It should never be Eve. It should always be Hava or Hawa, really. Uh, Havila means labor in childbirth, essentially Eve's curse from the garden and the land of her and Adam's exile from the garden. There you go. Uh, we also prove that is the land of creation. That's what it says in Genesis. Yes, it's there. It's been there all along. Scholars just don't know how to read it because they don't have the book of Jubilees, which clarifies that's how you read it. So in 2200 BC, Tarshish, a Greek, get that. So we're covering Greek history here, folks. Got that? No, not of the Greek Empire, which didn't exist until about 800 BC anyway. Um, but Greek, nonetheless, traveled to pick up Ophir and brothers and take them to ancient Havila, which would be renamed for the patriarchs Ophir, Sheba, and Tarshish especially, as well as Havila, who is the other brother uh, who was named, obviously, after the land of Eve. How about that, prophetically? Ophir lived in... Misha, or Mishad, Iran. Now, we prove that very well. Uh, it's not up for debate. Though, we do take on an ignorant Gnostic who created 21 videos of complete, utter nonsense. Uh, and <laughs> watch Misha to Safar. That video is there in Solomon's Gold series. However, Tarshish was the first to circumnavigate Africa after the flood. And he was Greek. This is where the Bible goes. Circumnavigating Africa is not foreign to the Bible. And we'll cover a few such ancient accounts. Uh, but then we'll go to history specifically to the Greeks as well as the Persians. Uh, we're going to do that in this video. Uh, this is really no mystery whatsoever. It never has been. It's just a matter of connecting things that historians love to disconnect because they like to discount things that are valid history, you know, like the Bible. Um, and you just can't. You just can't. Not legitimately and not credibly. Every scholar who claims the Bible has no history within is no scholar at all, period. They should be fired. And no one should listen to them. They don't know what they're talking about. The ships of Tarshish picked the sons of Joktan up, likely on the Persian Gulf, perhaps even in Shinar, which was the capital uh, of the world at that time where the Tower of Babel once stood. Now, and in that era, it was still there. That was the lay of the land, uh, and actually, according to the words of the Archangel Michael, which we've covered, which actually affirms this Genesis 10 account of, of Joktan's migration, it actually talks about their migration before the tower was destroyed. So it does appear that is the case. So, But that was the lay of the land. Iran was a ways away, but still within the purview uh, and paid taxes to uh, the, you know, to Shinar. Ophir's family would travel there to pay their taxes and for other reasons, I'm sure, if nothing else. They also had family there, uh, likely. Um, and that called, uh, that's just called reason. That's called logic. I mean, we're just taking these things and we're putting them together. That's what we're doing. Don't pay attention to those incapable of such in academia nor scholarship because they'll just lead you nowhere. Test them. 
Now, unless Tarshish had a helicopter, his ships had to travel from the Mediterranean into the Atlantic, around Africa, into the Indian Ocean, and up into the Persian Gulf, making Tarshish the first to circumnavigate Africa historically after the flood that we know of, and this we have documented where? In the Bible. Now, he would pick up Ophir and brothers there and take them to the land of Ophir, Sheba and Tarshish in the far east. Genesis 10, we have covered in full at this point in this series. If you haven't watched the series, Solomon's Gold series, go back and watch from part one and all the way through, it will blow your mind. There's a reason why it has millions of views. Now, we've we've covered that, though, and it tells us that Jackson's sons, Ophir, Sheba, Havilah, migrated from Misha, Meshad, Iran, as thou goest to, that means they migrated to, Safar, the tree of life, which is in the Garden of Eden. That's what that Hebrew word means and refers to. So it's the land of the Garden of Eden. To the Mount of the East, and we've covered Jubilees and Enoch, identifying the Mount of the East and Mountains of Eden that Enoch uh, basically describes, uh, as well as the words of the Archangel Michael I just mentioned, uh, who talks about the nine mountains of the east. We cover that in answers in First Enoch. It's all there. All of these are the same. The isles, islands after the flood, were ancient mountains. Uh, watch our Rivers from Eden series. We prove that. Thus, Mount of the East, see. Uh, in fact, there's, there's nine mounts of the east, mountains of the east, according to the Archangel Michael. They're all in the Philippines, modern Philippines, and we prove that out. This trip in ancient times was famous, and this is why the ships of Tarshish are called out in Scripture several times. Tarshish would then receive land there as payment for the travel, obviously. Does the Bible come out and say it? You know, the Bible doesn't come out and say a lot of things, but when you see the beginning of the narrative and the end of the narrative, it's obvious what happened. But how do we know? Because now Tarshish is documented several times in Scripture as a place next to Ophir in the far east with the same resources, it's the same uh, travel, it's the same distance, it's the same that Solomon's navy went to over and over. Now we've proven that many times over in this series already. Spain is not Tarshish. Or why would the kings of Spain then go out and hire explorer after explorer to go to Tarshish? Duh. Don't call yourself an historian. Don't call yourself a Bible scholar if you don't know that. I mean, that is illiterate. And Ophir, uh, as well, is identified there in the islands of Southeast Asia, which we've shown in map after map after map after map, story after story, contract even from the king, uh, Sebastian Cabot. I mean, we've got tons on that. Specifically, the Philippines, which history affirms many times as the ancient land of Ophir and Tarshish, or Christ in Greek, gold, uh, Argyre in Greek, silver. Same as Ophir and Tarshish, land of gold, land of silver. Now, doesn't jive, and it's the wrong direction as far as uh, Africa, as far as Spain, neither fit. King Solomon hired Hiram, king of Tyre, a Phoenician who ruled the seas of the Mediterranean at that time with trade routes established all the way to Spain and even Britain for that matter. Yet Solomon was, well, evidently, they're calling him dumb enough to hire him to, well, abandon his trade routes and forget they even exist and instead extend his journey by something like four times uh, as much to go to places, well, that he already had established trade. That would be really dumb. These are not academics nor scholars when they say such things. They're not thinking. They're not using even their brain at all. They lack basic reasoning. So basically, Tarshish, a very ancient Greek, already circumnavigated Africa according to history. We call it the Bible. It's history. He picked up Ophir and brothers, likely in the Persian Gulf area, and transported them to the modern Philippines, which is Ophir, Tarshish, and 
The Garden of Eden exists underneath, within the earth, according to Enoch, uh, Noah, Moses, and an incredibly abundant history. We have covered, even with maps, uh, all the way to the, about the 1700s. Now, once they settled there, as early as 2000 to 1500 BC, ancient Ophir, Philippines, was already trading in their ships cross-regionally in Vietnam and Taiwan, and by at least 990 BC, they were arriving in China in Canton to trade. Now, we cover this in the search for King Solomon's treasure with Science Journal sources, even. Uh, I know, aren't we just crazy, though, to say that Tarshish made this journey in 2200 BC? It's not even possible, is it? Well, we've tested the ships. Watch that video, part five. Uh, and the Phoenician ships absolutely could do this uh, with ease. But we're going to cover history that's going to show you that, in fact, this was done by the Greeks. We're going to take our time with this, and we're going to teach. That's what we do. Except the Spanish well knew this from the history of the Philippines. The history it tried to wipe out, of course. Uh, yet, here's Father Colin, preserving it, in 1663. That's called history, by the way, just saying, and that this was really so, and that the principal settler of these archipelagos was Tarshish, son of Javan, or Ionan, Greek, an ancient Greek, together with his brothers, also Greeks, as were Ophir and Havila of India. Hmm. Now note, India in the 1663 era mindset sprawled all the way from Misha, Iran, uh, in the west, all the way to, uh, so that's accurate and consistent, all the way to, really, the Philippines, all the way to the Indies. Now he's not saying modern India geographically, uh, and it fits. So don't try to read into that. You can't. We see in the 10th chapter of Genesis, exactly, in verses 26 through 30, which we've covered so many times, which treats the dispersion, the migrations at the time of Babel, that's why he used the word dispersion, notice that, of the peoples and the settlement of countries as we establish in another place. So they migrated to another place, to the Philippines, and that's where Tarshish now had real estate, uh, as well as Ophir and Sheba. Again, Tarshish's payment for his famous ships, taking them there. They got there somehow, and that is obviously how. Now, the Spanish knew this in 1663, and here you have uh, historical affirmation. They had the written, documented history of the Philippines. They, of course, have now erased it uh, over the recent centuries, but this tells us it did exist, and it does in the Bible, which cannot be erased. No, he's not the only one. We have covered many more, including Columbus, who put in writing uh, what would become known as the Philippines was Ophir and Tarshish. We've covered that well, including the map he used according to his journey. The Baha'im Globe, commissioned by the Portuguese government, identified the Philippines as Christ, the land of gold, Ophir, uh, and uh, Argyre is right there too, the land of silver, which is Tarshish. Tarshish is the land of silver in Scripture. We've covered that many times over. Again, read the search for King Solomon's treasure. We document all of that, supported by a 300-page source book. But, of course, we don't try to prove. Yeah, right. Yeah. Before his journey there in 1521, Magellan noted the Philippines as Ophir and Tarshish we covered. In 1522, the king of Spain in Sebastian Cabot's contract documents the modern Philippines as Ophir and Tarshish. All these sources are right there. We show you what we use. It's right there in the source book. Uh, read the book and follow along in the source book. We've documented everything, and it is proven at this point. 
Also the same year, Spanish government document number 98 identifies the Philippines as Ophir and Tarshish by name. That's what it calls them. 1601, Antonio Galvao uh, defines the Philippines as Ophir and Tarshish. 1607, Dominican Gregorio uh, Garcia does the same. We even find as late as 1891, former prime minister of the Philippines, Paterno still identified the Philippines as the ancient land of gold, Ophir. Now, this has never been a mystery, and it proves Tarshish did make this journey. That's the point here. He was a Greek, and he circumnavigated Africa to make this happen. He had to. But is there not other support? I mean, it's as if academics and Bible scholars don't even want to know these things. Just go read a Bible dictionary on Ophir and Tarshish, and they are stupid. They are the dumbest writings we've ever seen. They've done zero research, and they give you no facts whatsoever. It is a lie. So, uh, you know, they'll say, la, 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 I can't hear you. <laughs> that's really what they say, and that's all they say. And then they say, when you tell them the facts, no, uh Oh, that's so scholarly of you. That's so academic. That's so just so bright. No, it's not. It's called willing ignorance, according to Second Peter, and that's what we're dealing with in this age. We will not go there. Let's prove this out now. Advanced to 970 BC, we have well proven this. Solomon builds his famous navy and port on the Red Sea. Uh, not the Mediterranean. He's not circ circumnavigating Africa, but the point is where he's going. And they go to Ophir and Tarshish by name. And it's in the far east, beyond the Indian Ocean, a multitude of islands. There's much there. Uh, we're going to cover more on that next video as well, because we're going to get into some maps. Uh, which can only be there because his narratives define the resources that are not found in most of the areas making claims. Uh, that are also in the wrong direction and territory, such as Africa, which is in Ham's territory, and fits nothing of this story. Uh, Spain, Britain, they all fail miserably. Saudi Arabia, Yemen is a huge joke uh, that Solomon spent all this money and time to build a port and navy to take a three-year round-trip journey, uh, and the resources aren't even there when they're all but, what, three months away and... <laughs> Uh, already paid Solomon tribute as the kings of Arabia. Now, that's pretty dumb. Uh, can these scholars even read? Well, evidently not. They can't put things together, that's for sure. Uh, they're really not scholars of the Bible when they do this. Uh, again, we prove this throughout Solomon's Gold series. We ain't reproving those 80 videos or more uh, in this one, obviously. Uh, attempt to debate all of that, well, be muted, uh, no debate in ignorance here, our channel, our rules. You will review our positions before trying to debate, and once you do, you'll find you can't debate. That's the fact. This is what practically all scholars have missed regarding this topic. In 850 BC, Yahuwah himself wiped out the ships of Tarshish and port as well on the Red Sea for good. No one was using it. Now that point of entry was lost. Again, that's 850 BC, and the story of Jonah is about to happen with this in mind. These are the conditions scholars just ignore. They miss it uh, when they try to project Jonah stayed somewhere in the Mediterranean, uh, and the Tarshish must be somewhere there, which doesn't fit the narrative whatsoever, fails miserably. It just cannot. Uh, there's also no monkeys, elephants, peacocks, etc. there uh, in those lands natively. Uh, Britain and Spain are out. They cannot be Tarshish. The Bible tells you that Tarshish has things that they don't have. However, the ship's of Tarshish, named for the ones going from Israel to Tarshish, Philippines are gone at that point and no longer an option, again, setting up the conditions for the next story. However, Jonah tells us the ships of Tarshish from the land of Tarshish, not the ones from Israel, some get confused there, 
the original ones, the land itself in the Far East were still running. And guess what? They were circumnavigating Africa, which his narrative is extremely clear, leaving no room for anything else. Hmm, this is interesting. And again, Tarshish was Greek, and his descendants would be of Greek descent, whether they lived in Greece or not. In part three, we restore Jonah's actual journey according to the Bible account, which almost every scholar and even pastor at that level has wrong. They just teach it wrong because they don't know and they're taught inaccurate geography. They just don't know what they're talking about. First, they forgot the Red Sea port was toast, and that's a huge forget. It's gone, and all the ships as well. So the only option was to circumnavigate Africa into the Atlantic, into the Mediterranean, and then Jonah says, this is history and geography right there in the Bible, says the ships going to Tarshish were right there in Joppa, Israel. That's on the coast of Israel on the Mediterranean, not on the Red Sea. Somehow they got around there. Now Jonah says the ship was in 800 BC, so it was. And how exactly can we miss nor dismiss that? Willing ignorance, of course. So here we have history, yes, history, that in 800 BC, the ships of Tarshish, the Greek ships, yes, from the Greek colony over in the Philippines, were able to show up in Joppa, Israel, on the Mediterranean. How about that? Uh, there was no Suez Canal yet, and the Red Sea port was out of commission. They circumnavigated Africa. It was the only option, and it's documented right here in 800 B.C., so who did? Well, the ships of Tarshish from the Philippines did. Israel's ships of Tarshish, named for where they would go, uh, weren't in existence anymore. Now that's what Jonah says because, and here's the detail, he was headed to Tarshish in the Far East, never identified in any biblical narrative as anywhere else, especially not Spain nor Britain, which are laughable assertions. Uh, again, produced the monkeys, the apes, and the peacocks, and, uh, and, and the elephants. Um, and, and we gladly consider it, but since you don't have them, you have nothing. And since the king of Spain hired a British explorer to go to Tarshish and Ophir in the Far East, in the area of the Philippines, we just say, duh, read your history. You're not an academic on this issue. You're not a scholar if that's the case. Now watch part three of Solomon's Gold series where we break this story down in detail and prove it out. There are two periods in which three days are invoked here. Now this is important, critical, and many don't even recognize the second, again, because of something that comes out of pulpits, which is a lie. It's an absolute lie and easily disproven, let me tell you. First, Jonah was swallowed by the fish, probably Leviathan or whatever it was. Leviathan uh, breathed fire. He's like a fire-breathing sea dragon of sort. And he was created by Yahuwah, by the way. He's not an evil spirit. He's an actual creation. And um, so he would have oxygen in his apparatus, and he would be large enough for Jonah to fit and breathe for the three days and three nights. And by the way, that's no fairy tale because Messiah confirmed this as fact in the first century in Matthew 12 and Luke 11. So you can't argue that. So don't let them treat it any, any other way but history because it is. If you don't think the son of Yahuwah knows his history and when he spoke, it identified and affirmed history, well, then you just don't believe the Bible. Don't pretend that you do, and certainly don't call yourself a Bible scholar, right? Now, Jonah is spit up, but the next part tells where he had to have been spit up, uh, preserving that Tarshish is east of the Persian Gulf, indisputably in the Orient. Now, once spit up on shore, Jonah 3.3 3 says, so Noah, or so Jonah arose, not Noah. <laughs> so Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh. 
okay, according to the word of Yahuwah. This is after he was spit up. That's the actual word there, by the way, in Hebrew, Y-H-W-H, watch the name of God series. His name is Yahuwah. Now, Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. This is where pastors come in and err consistently. We've heard this in many different denominations, and it is utterly illiterate of Scripture. Uh, we're aware in many pulpits when relating this, they actually tell us, oh, this means that Nineveh was so big, it took three days to cross from one end of the city to the other. Is that what it says? Actually, no, if you just read it in English, it's pretty plain. However, that's ridiculous, as we have found the ruins of ancient Nineveh in archaeology. And it has a wall around it. And we can measure that wall. Now, we cover the details again in part three, but it was not even a one-day journey from one end to the other. Whether alone three days, that is a lie. And unfortunately, many pastors don't know this. The fact is, this tells us where Jonah was spit up, thus the reason for the lie at the higher levels. They don't want us to know this. They've been hiding Ophir and Tarshish for good reason, because it will rise in the last days and it will rebuke those Pharisees. Wherever it was, uh, it would have to be a three-day journey that he was spit up. It would have to be a three-day journey from there to get to Nineveh. Now, no, we don't then inject, oh, he was, you know, he, he got into a transporter and he was beamed like Star Trek. And, well, by the way, that there goes three days because that wouldn't take three days, right? So even that doesn't make sense. But that's what you have to do in order to try to make what pastors are saying work. They don't know biblical geography most of the time, not for ancient times. Now, that rules out the Mediterranean completely because there's no place on the Mediterranean that you can get to Nineveh in three days with uh, camels and, and ships on the Euphrates and different places uh, at that time. Uh, the shortest journey we can find uh, at any point from the Mediterranean is 10 and a half days or greater. Now, we test that out fully. We provide all the details. It's right there. Watch part three. But it fails. However, it is a three-day journey up the Tigris River to Nineveh, but only from the Persian Gulf. That's it. Nothing else works. See, Jonah preserved the geography that Tarshish was beyond this point in the far east. The ship he was on, which somehow got to Joppa, had to circumnavigate Africa. It did. Now, do we have the details where it says we went to this coordinate and we passed this coordinate and we passed that coordinate? Well, no, we don't, but we don't need it. This is ancient history, folks. I mean, it is absolutely illiterate for academia to place such constraints on ancient history. Yes, today we'd have CCTV footage, right? Uh, we have lots of ways that we could prove things out. And, uh, you know, there may be even GPS uh, data. Uh, you know, we have lots of ways. We didn't have any of that back then. So to try to take that paradigm and put it on these ancient factual historic accounts is stupidity. So, basically, according to Jonah the prophet, this is the case. That's valid history. Again, affirmed by Messiah himself. So if you are a professor trying to say, no, uh who do you think you are? You are not the son of Yahuwah. Sorry. So that's 2200 BC, 970 BC, and 800 BC from a biblical view. Okay? Uh, now for some Greek history with more to come in the following two videos because there's so much evidence it will overwhelm this for sure. Now we're going to start with this and then we're going to go ahead and take you through basically to the first century. In the next video we're going to deal with the first maps by the Greeks, uh, some of them which identify such. Uh, and when we're done with that, we're then going to take you all the way back to even before this era, even 800 BC, and we'll prove it. You'll see. 
And also, let us not forget, circumnavigating Africa, again, is no impediment to the Bible paradigm whatsoever. It's only academia that made up such a thinking, right? I mean, it's, you talk about scoffing. The very nonsensical thought that, well, man couldn't circumnavigate Africa. Well, why couldn't he? Why couldn't he? Uh, well, because I don't have a, a map of it. Oh, yes, we do. We'll show you. You know, th these things are actually there. Um, they're just not putting them together, and they're keeping them disconnected so that they can tell you, uh-uh, no uh no way. Yeah, right. Okay. Not only did Tarshish do it in ancient times, Jonah hopped on a ship from Tarshish, Philippines. It got there somehow, and it had to circumnavigate Africa. Uh, but also in 6 BC, and we'll show you, two years after the birth of Messiah, no, not at his birth, the three kings, well, actually six or more, uh, and they were kings definitively, so any scholar saying they weren't can't read, uh, David says they would be in Psalm 72. This is prophetic, but still, David's prophecy reigns true and accurate. Beginning in verse 10, the kings of Tarshish, Philippines, and of the isles, that's Ophir, Philippines, shall bring presents to whom? Ah, to Messiah, you'll see. That's the only one who could fit this narrative, you'll see. I know, if you have a Catholic Bible, it begins with, of Solomon. That's stupid. Throw it out. Uh, that Bible is ridiculous. Uh, this cannot be Solomon because he can't do the things that uh, are attributed to this person here. This is Messiah. The kings of Sheba, that's Philippines, and Seba, Saba, Philippines, still, uh, shall offer gifts. This is only Messiah's birth, and most certainly not Solomon's, which is nonsense. Yet, even some Bibles, such as, again, the Catholic Bible, render such, and it's illiterate. They can't read simple sentences with understanding. And we've covered this completely in our uh, we Three Kings of Philippines are video. You can go there for full evidence and support. Uh, yes, we test what Daniel calls a magi, and it ain't what modern scholars are calling a magi, uh, who is an occult priest. No, thank you. Uh, like Yahuwah would want to uh, let occult priests know about the birth of his son. Why? So they could kill him? I mean, that's just yeah, it's idiotic and shouldn't be in scholarship, but it is. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. What? That's not Solomon. All nations shall serve him. That ain't remotely Solomon. Read your Bible. Only the kings of Arabia paid him tribute, not the whole world. They certainly did not worship him, and no one better, and all nations never served Solomon, period. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth. The poor also, and him that hath no helper. Now, that's Messiah. Solomon did not do that. Uh, he shall spare the poor and needy, and shall save the souls of the needy. Oops. You mean to tell me the Catholic Bible just said that Solomon can save souls? That's illiterate. That is only Yahushua Messiah, period. He shall redeem their soul. What? Only Messiah can. Solomon could not from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. Solomon did not have such care. Verse 15, and he shall live, and to him shall be given the gold of Sheba, that's Philippines, which is Ophir Philippines. Sheba is Ophir's brother from Joktan, from Shem, not the wrong Sheba in Ethiopia, who had the legs and hoof of a goat in the false occult tale from the Kibra Nagask. We covered that too. Uh, now that's bad. Okay. Prayer also shall be made for him continually. Oops. Solomon be dead. Long dead. Nobody's praying to him. Period. Nobody's praying for him. Period. Only Messiah fits this. And daily shall he be praised. Never Solomon in any sense or any context whatsoever. Now here's the route they took as the ships of Tarshish returned to Israel again. Another circumnavigation of Africa. Again, the Red Sea port was not an option to them. 
not biblically, never again. Never again would that port be renewed in the days of ancient Israel. Not by Israel, and it actually fell into enemy hands, uh, which we've covered history for that in the search for King Solomon's treasure. That's there as well. Okay, so that's what the Bible says. Those who don't believe the Bible, well, this is a channel who does. And we teach from a biblical foundation and perspective. Really, truly the only one to have. This is our channel, and we always will. Don't ask us otherwise. To dismiss the oldest writings in history as not history is, well, just not something we will ever entertain as logic, because it's stupid. And we will always call those who think in such manner exactly that, uh, ignorant indeed, willingly so, obviously. Yes, uh, just like Messiah did to the Pharisees, we'll do the same. We'll continue to rebuke such false paradigms as that is a large part of why we are here and things are so messed up. Uh, we love them enough to show love in rebuke as no one loves someone they will not rebuke. Let's be clear. Our foundation is set, and yes, the Bible lays out that Tarshish, a Greek, and his Greek brothers most certainly circumnavigated Africa in around 2200 B.C., we have very firmly proven in 970 B.C. Solomon's navy of Phoenician and Israelite sailors led by Hiram, king of Tyre, a Phoenician king at that, uh, traveled from the Red Sea port, newly built, uh, in a fleet of ships newly fabricated by the Phoenicians. In fact, uh, they were Phoenician designed, and they went to Ophir, Philippines, which is also Tarshish, to fetch gold and very exotic resources, we've covered this in great detail, that identify the Far East. They certainly don't identify Saudi Arabia, Yemen. Uh, they certainly don't identify Britain or Spain. These are nonsensical. Uh, you know, just, they, they don't even deserve a thought because they fail so miserably so quickly. Jonah documented historically that in his era, his, uh, around 800 B.C., a ship was there in Joppa, Israel, on the Mediterranean Sea, and that ship came from the biblical Tarshish, which is only in one place. It's only in the Philippines, nowhere else. That's a long trip indeed. And what was Jonah doing? He was running away from Yahuwah. He wasn't looking for the most efficient journey. As Tarshish is in the Philippines, and there is no other option, that means they circumnavigated Africa to get there because the Red Sea port was broken up. And the Bible tells us the three kings, really six or more, according to David, uh, and we showed you, yes, they are kings indeed, came from Tarshish, Ophir, the Isles, Sheba and Seba once again, with an offering just as the queen of Sheba gave to the temple project. See, this is a biblical giving. It's the same thing that Adam did in the first sacrifice, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Queen of Sheba, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and precious stones added. And now the three kings, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. See, something's going on here. This is a biblical covenant uh, you know, uh, offering. Uh, from the very land of creation itself, from the land of Adam and Eve, to which Ophir migrated. And only this time, this oblation is to Messiah as a toddler. It took them two years to get there because they too had to circumnavigate Africa. And yes, the Red Sea port, broken up in those days, and controlled by the enemies of Israel. You weren't getting passage into Israel from there. Now, thus, yes, the ancients did circumnavigate Africa. That's just fact, folks, but we ain't done. Now, in the next video, let's delve into the history of the Phoenicians, Greeks. Uh, same, Greece conquered and absorbed Phoenicia, and Persians especially as well. Uh, then, 
the first century mapping mindset. And finally, we will locate the infamous Greek river Oceanus, which surrounds the whole world, comparing it to the rivers from Eden, which it matches. And guess what? In these accounts, many written in 800 BC or so, the Greeks say they circumnavigated, they sailed around the entire continent, or most of it, of Africa in order to get there. Because, well, they did. That will be phenomenal. And a home run to, a grand slam home run to wrap it up. Can't wait to get there, but these all have incredible value uh, to this entire narrative. Thank you for watching. We have over 470 videos on this channel, one for every day of the year plus now. Uh, many just as profound with some 50 or so in Tagalog for Filipinos and now six in Spanish to start. We also have been setting up subtitles for 20 plus languages for most of our videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications of new uploads. Join our email list as YouTube fails to notify often. And we will notify you ourselves at thegodculture.com. Just fill in the pop-up there. We now have alternative platforms for videos on Rumble, Odyssey, and Utreon. And our new podcast is available for all of our videos pretty much as well. All links in the description box. And friend us on Facebook at The God Culture Space hyphen space original. That is our only Facebook page. Only one that we're checking and using. Uh, if you prefer an alternative... We now have Parlor and Gab, links below. We have six books published internationally, being read in over 100 countries. Uh, and actually, I correct that, it's now seven. How about that? Uh, with our new release, the first book of Bible History Illustrated, Enoch's Animal Dream Visions. We also have now launched Ophir Philippines Coffee Table Book in the U.S., Canada, U.K., and many overseas markets on Amazon, and it's available in hardcover or softcover there. Also, this uh, first book of Bible History Illustrated is available only in color. We're not even doing this in black and white. Only in color, and you can get it in color, uh, softcover, or hardcover on Amazon. Uh, coming to the Philippines soon, not yet, we're not there yet, but we will get there. Additionally, we launched the Book of Jubilees, the Torah calendar, with color maps and interiors, as so many had requested that overseas, uh, rightfully so. Uh, we already have that in the Philippines. Uh, the Philippine copies have color maps inside already. Uh, that too is available on Amazon in hardcover, softcover, both in color or in black and white soft cover, if you wish. Uh, all books, including Solomon's Treasurer, are now free in ebook. Uh, we're not going to do an ebook for this one because we have this video series animated, and we're going to release one with all five uh, as one video as well. So, no need to do an ebook when we'll have the video animation. Uh, more coming soon. Thank you for watching. Now, always remember, prove all things for yourself. Yah bless to everyone.